So earlier today, we hosted a panel discussion that looked at the tech behind AI. Now we're going to explore how businesses can identify and capitalize on emerging opportunities around AI, incorporating new advances into their business models and day-to-day -day operations. I'd like to welcome to the stage Charlotte Yarconi, President of Commerce and e Ecosystems and Microsoft's Cloud and AI division, Diego Oppenheimer, entrepreneur and partner at AI-focused venture capital firm Factory, Gaurav Oberai, co-founder and CEO of Lexion, a Seattle AI startup that's looking to transform how companies analyze contracts. Yeah, yeah, I know it's high. It's high energy. We're gonna get get the get that blood blood flow in here today. But before we get going with today's panel, I wanted to share a short video from from our friends at Bernstein, which kind of puts all this AI hype in perspective. Let's take a look. The tech industry loves a buzzword. Crypto. Of the crypto winter hung over last weekend's Bitcoin bash in Miami. A self-driving taxi service called Waymo is coming to Los Angeles. A self-driving car getting pulled over by police in San Francisco. When it comes to printing human body parts, the future is already here. <laughs> the metaverse. For the metaverse. Starting today, our company is now Meta. <laughs> AI is having a very busy year. Chat GPT. Chat GPT. Chat GPT. What you just heard me reading wasn't written by me. It was written by artificial intelligence. Chat GPT. AI race, it's on. In fact, a race starts today. This technology is going to reshape. Reshape the world. It's a new paradigm. A new paradigm. Change the paradigm. It's every day. We want to bring out new things. New ways of doing things. And then the next breakthrough came. Generative AI. Every company is going to have to adapt to AI. We are not going to be ready for what's coming next. We need our AI systems to not just be optimizing for engagement, but for the human values that actually support society. I think we'll see it in areas like education, healthcare, and others really helping and enhancing our ability to aid people. We're moving from the autopilot era of AI to co-pilot era of AI. Humans are in the loop versus being right. out of the loop. Making AI helpful for everyone is the most profound way we will advance our mission. Hey, thanks to our partners at Bernstein for that video. Uh, I think it sets things in perspective. Obviously, a lot of hype right now around AI. Uh, my question is, is, there, is it different with this cycle of AI? I mean, is it different than crypto and 3D printing and VR? Is there anything that's fundamentally different here? I can take this. Go, go ahead, Garab, hop in. Um, uh, so, you know, I, it is different in a few ways. I think one is uh, the whole cycle of hype seems to be happening very, very quickly. Uh, it, it's much more compressed. And, for folks in the audience who are familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, or if you're not, it's, you know, it's, Gartner, uh, it's Gartner's observation that a lot of these tech trends tend to follow the same cycle. Like the, the technology comes out, you see this exponential increase in interest, new startups, lots of investment, large incumbents going after it. It reaches some sort of a peak, at which point you know, people will say things like, gosh, everyone's talking about it, but I'm not using any of these products, or hey, every uh, tech event I go to, there's like three panels on Gen AI. And, and we're, we're definitely there, I think, right now for a lot of customers. In fact, Gartner said we're at the peak of this hype cycle a couple of weeks ago. After that comes the trough of disillusionment when people turn around and go, well, you know, uh, I, I'm not really sure this is useful, and I've seen so many demos, and does this really work? And customers tend to sort of walk away. Meanwhile, um, and, and some companies will fail, some investors will stop investing, but the builders that are succeeding will, will sort of keep on uh, the, the, what is it, what is that? The slope of enlightenment that eventually leads to the plateau of productivity. So, you know, if you think about, if you think about <laughs> the internet. It sounds like a very Gartner thing. It's here. very Gartner. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's very two by two <laughs> matrix. But, 
But you know, it's so compressed right now. Like in December, when I spoke with investors, they were like, oh my gosh, you guys are doing stuff with Gen AI. This is so exciting. And then in January, it was like, are you just a shallow rapper on top of OpenAI? And then three months later, it was like, are you guys fine tuning? What about RAG and retrieval augmented generation? And so like, it is just happening so, so fast. And these cycles, which may have taken years, like with the internet, with mobile, with social, just think like Amazon peak crashed and then Amazon's you know, huge company. We're seeing it happen here as well. Charlotte. Yeah, I think um, I do think there are a lot of similarities. Although I do think there are some unique things about this. And Gaurav highlighted one of the the first ones is the velocity and pace by which we're seeing this technology come and mature is just very different than what we've seen before. You know, from my side, we work a lot with startups um, across the ecosystem, and Prior to AI, you would look at a startup that had a great idea trying to move to MVP and then potentially landing their first big commercial deals. You know, if you were exceptional, that was a two year journey for you, if you were exceptional. And with AI, we've seen that happen, you know, from last October into March of April of this year. We saw several companies landing their first commercial contract. So, that was, that was fascinating. It wasn't just the value proposition that they were doing, it's also how they were able to build up their, their value proposition so quickly. And I think that's the other nuance with this trend. When you think about just how it's changing how we build tech, you think about it at the UI layer and it's becoming much more of a natural language. It's just, it's, it represents a different experience that we can enable. You think about the application tier and, and how it's really becoming more of an AI controlled flow where you invoke plugins and you contribute skills that used to require a lot of complex knowledge and take a lot of time to write code for. And then the third area that it's really quite different in my opinion is around data and how, how it is, is really more focused on vector databases and endpoints and a lot of the innovation that's happening there. So it, it, while it is the same, there are nuances for sure in my mind. So Diego, you're a venture capitalist investing in companies, but you're also an entrepreneur building companies and you're a chief product officer at, at a couple AI companies and have been in this industry forever. I'm curious, as we head towards the trough of disillusionment, which sounds very scary, um, how are you thinking about building your businesses or investing in those businesses? Yeah, so I think some of the fundamental things that haven't changed is if you are just adding AI for the sake of AI, it's a pretty bad recipe. Uh, ultimately, like what we're seeing is like this is an amazing technology that allows you to achieve certain things. It allows you to achieve uh, you know, certain optimizations, certain automations, and there has to be a destination to the use of technology. Uh, you know, the, the, the way that I like to kind of like, like frame it a little bit brutishly is to say, look, it shouldn't matter. Like if you're trying to achieve something, if it's AI or 100 monkeys, but they achieve the same thing, it shouldn't matter, right? Like you're, you're going for a goal set on, on what's trying to happen. I think the interesting, and this kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, goes on, on the, the tales of what Charlotte was saying, is like a couple of things that have changed is we have these very generalizable models. So previously, you know, AI is not new. We've been working, at least when I've probably been working in machine learning for like a, a, a little bit of a long time. They were very what I'd call narrow, like they could do one or two tasks very well, you would do a bunch of stuff. We suddenly now get the discovery of these very generalizable models, which is this concept of the foundational models or large language models, which is a subset of it. And we're still in the discovery phase of all the generalizable tasks that they can do. And so when we don't actually know the limits or what they can and cannot do all the way through, um, we let our imaginations run. And so a lot of the disillusionment is gonna come from that. Uh, while we're, because we're still figuring out how to use them, what's best to use them, but they're really powerful in creating a lot of automation. And that automation is really powerful if you're building companies with them. So, so the question I ask always with companies like, okay, why are you using this technology? What is it for? Like, what is the goal function that you're chasing? Um, and is, you know, going through AI gonna actually get you there faster versus any other methodology? Yeah. So, so the venture capital numbers going into AI, it's still at, at record numbers and increasing when you compare it to other sectors of, of the economy. 
but it seems like a very challenging area to either invest in or build a company in. And Diego, you actually shared this uh, professor's writings with me, which is great, and I just want to read a quick uh, segment from it. It's Ethan Mollock, a professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at the Wharton School at UPenn. He said, AI is weird. No one actually knows the full range of capabilities of the most advanced large language models like GPT-4. No one really knows the best ways to use them or the conditions under which they fail. There's no instruction manual. On some tasks, AI is immensely powerful, and on others, it fails completely or subtly. So my question is, how do you build a business around something like that? It seems like a very challenging thing to try to predict or uh, go into. Um, so, so I think, um, th so there's a couple of things. It, it's, un it's unknown what the capabilities are. It's unknown how to uh, work with these models and make them do exactly what you want. Or, or we have some research and we have some approaches, but it's all moving very fast. Um, the way we look at it is, uh, we started working with Gen AI as soon as it was available, which was, you know, OpenAI started making their APIs available back, not, not last year, but the year prior. And uh, product builders spend a lot of time trying to understand what are the capabilities, where does it fail, and then how do we actually translate this into something our customers want to pay for? For us, that meant automation around the rote parts of the contract management process. That's what we help with. And so one of the things we've done with this technology is build uh, a co-pilot for lawyers that lives inside Word that will automatically redline the contract uh, that is sent to you with your sort of playbook and, and the positions that you'll look at. Now, if you look at a product like this, you, you might think, well, how do you know that's going to work? And then, you know, what, where do you go from there? Um, so for us, there's absolutely an R&D portion of this. So we invest, you know, time into researching the capabilities but then uh, I think one of the remarkable things with Gen AI is it's, it's been very easy to build a fantastic prototype very quickly, but then getting something hardened and production ready is still a big challenge. And I think that's what a lot of startups and investors and the whole ecosystem is beginning to realize that, hey, it's, it's, it's really easy to make a, a chatbot that can answer HR questions automatically, but what happens when someone asks, hey, what's our uh, parental leave policy? and it just hallucinates an answer, and it's totally wrong, and now someone's making life decisions based on that. So, you know, and then what happens when you turn around and say, well, okay, we've put some guardrails now, so it'll like highlight the right portion of the employee policy, but, you know, it, new questions are popping up. How do I make sure those don't uh, end up, uh, we see hallucinations there? Uh, how do we actually curb the model so that it, it stays within line, but also anything we tell it that's wrong, it learns quickly and adapts. So these are all the kinds of challenges builders are facing. Um, we have lots of tools at our disposal to try these things, but it is, still, it is still kind of a research project, and things are changing so fast every day um, that you know, part of it is keeping pace with what's possible and applying it as we build these things. I think one thing to add to that is like, you know, while AI is new and a bunch of, you know, we talked about how like some of the abilities and the skill sets of these models we don't really understand, the core of business has it changed, right? You need to build something people want. You need to build something that's useful. You need to build something that's augmented a human experience in one way or another, and that is either improving a process or not. And so if you boil down what's being used, and do you asked about the question of like, how do I make this a useful business or how do I understand it? It's like, well, that's what the core of it is, right? Is, it, is this something that is, you know, in augmenting a population's experience? Are they being more effective at achieving goals, goal A, B, or C? And this is a place where AI excels at, uh, in a lot of cases, when controlled for that environment. And so I think like that's the, the, the core kind of principle that you look at when you want to say, understand, okay, how is this business you know, uh, you know, going to achieve whatever its, its, its purpose is? Its purpose is not to do AI. Well, some businesses might be, its purpose might be to do AI, but that's not usually what the business should be about, right? It should be about achieving something with AI. So Charlotte, yeah, you work with a lot of different startups at Microsoft, and I'm, I'm curious if you've seen any commonalities that amongst the successful ones that are seeing traction. Right, yeah. Uh, and I have so much to offer to all yeah. of you. I'm going to try Jump to Jump in and we'll come back all. to that, yeah. Because I agree with both what Gaurav and Diego are saying. I, I do think it's, it is, the ones that we're seeing be successful are the ones that are solving problems for customers. There is a valuable customer use case that they are building around. So it starts less with, hey, I'm AI, and more, what am I trying to solve 
for you and your business. Uh, great examples, you know, healthcare, where you have to correlate a lot of different information that's transcribed and collected through a lot of different ways in, in sometimes different institutions to help diagnose patients. You know, how do you do that much more quickly, efficiently, on behalf of the doctors, on behalf of the patients? These are, that's a great use case, um, and actually one of the startups that we've seen that's been super successful. Additionally, thinking, um, another one I can think of off the top of my head is one that's using uh, visual AI to help um, with wildfire detection in California and how they've been able to use it and use it very effectively to bring down the, the false positives that they have to monitor 24-7 and to just really a minimal amount so that the firefighters can be appropriately placed and, and prevent wildfires. And so, you know, things like that I think are super meaningful. They're, they're, they start with what is the problem I'm trying to solve? What's the value proposition I'm trying to create? And then AI becomes the enablement to that, not sort of the grounding rod for what for their business. And, and I do think that's a key to success. Diego and Grav kind of said that as well. Um, I also think, you know, how you use AI, we're seeing an ecosystem build around that we talk about it as like the picks and shovels, if you, if you remember the analogy. Um, and, and who are those that are really helping others leverage AI, right? It, if it's uh, the snorkels or the pine cones and companies like that that are seeing great success because they're just finding ways to actually help others leverage AI so that they can better their business model, they can actually create a new and innovative business model. So I would say, from my perspective, customer, you know, solving customer problems and better enabling AI for those who are working on that, these are the, the key areas that we see at the moment. The picks and shovels analogy is a good one because one of the key topics when we were talking to people about the business panel here today was, and we have some big companies represented and some smaller startups, was is this, going to be just the domain of the Googles and Microsofts and Amazons of the world, or do startups have a role and a place to play? And I know, Gaurav, you talk a lot about making sure you have a moat around your business that you can protect that, but it's still the compute power that is needed for some of these companies to survive and thrive is huge. The data that's needed is, is huge, and this is why companies like Microsoft and Google are in such an advantageous position. So I'm curious how you're thinking about that balance as you're building companies, and then Charlotte would love your perspective on that too. Um, so right now, um, startups are largely using uh, the large language models provided by the big tech companies. Um, and, and in a sense, that makes that's actually the right thing to do. They should be focused on solving customer problems, actually figuring out applications of this technology, as opposed to necessarily tweaking the back end. Depends on your business model. If you're building a picks and shovels business, maybe you need to be you know, doing a lot more with LMs. I think we will start to see this change um, over the coming months. It's already we're seeing uh, you know, that Llama is a large open source LLM that Facebook has released. There's plenty of companies that are now looking at applying, um, using Llama, you know, hosted in one of these large data centers, uh, and then fine tuning it to make it work better for their use case. Um, for some people, that's imperative to do now. So for example, if you're making a consumer product that you're, that you're gonna sell for $20 a month, um, and it's going to make lots of calls to these LLMs, you're probably, your business model is probably not gonna work if you're gonna use one of these large models. So you're, you need to figure out how to make this work. Well, luckily, you sell to lawyers. We right? sell to lawyers. So you're not selling money. at twenty dollars a, a pop. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So there's also the you know what kind of what kind of uh, value exchange are you providing? When we're able to go in and say, hey, if you buy our tool and we'll save you multiple hours of counsel work, it, the, the ROI is very easy for people. So for us, we're still using some of these uh, uh, large uh, language models from these big providers, as opposed to. Uh, racing to bring it in-house. But even for us, I see advantages. And, and mostly for us, th those will be about improving quality and then also being able to create models that are specialized on customer data. So it's really important that these things um, learn from your activity and improve the context, uh, the, the, 
from your business. So for us, it would be, you know, I want you to respond in the way my legal team responds. I want you to rewrite this clause the way we've been doing it. And I want you to figure that out by looking at my body of agreements. Um, those are ways that we would, you know, start to look at, well, should we be fine tuning a large model that's hosted? Should we be bringing this model in-house, fine tuning it on our own? Should we be forking these models so there's a different one for different customers? Um, I, I think that ecosystem is still rapidly evolving. It's unclear how it's going to go. One thing that is likely true is the large cloud providers will still get our compute um, bills sent to them, because that's where we're hosting all of this stuff anyways. So, so. earlier today on the technology panel, we heard from David Shim of Read AI, and he mentioned that 93, this surprised me, 93% of their um, technology is, is built in-house and only 7% is, is reliant on the big tech titans out there. Yeah. What, what's your breakdown roughly? So we've been, you know, we started this company at the Allen Institute for AI back in 2019. And we've been building specialized AI models to understand what's in contracts for all these years. So a large part of our tech stack is still entirely built by us and in-house. We're building new features and new capabilities that are augmenting our end-to-end -end platform and for those, we are using um, these large language models that are hosted by these providers. So for us, it's still a much smaller fraction of what our overall product does. But over time, that will also change. As we start to build more functionality that takes advantage of these LLMs, um, we'll start to see a bigger dependence on LLMs initially uh, you know, tied to a large provider. But over time, we may start to bring these in-house as we look at the cost dynamics, the quality dynamics, the ability to fine tune these models to work right. really well for us. Charlotte or Diego, any thoughts on this debate on who's going to have uh, market share, I guess, in the AI landscape between the big tech and the startup world? So, so one of the things to, to think about is, uh, you know, we're at the very early stages of uh, net new technology and as what usually happens, and you can go observe everything since like Unix systems, like abstraction layers get added on top of that for achieving some level of experience. And so, you know, one could say, I'll, I'll just, I have no idea how Lexion does it, but I'll just kind of like talk in like generics, like maybe Lexion is using OpenAI's models, but like the chances of OpenAI being as good as Lexion as talking to lawyers, providing an experience to lawyers, understanding the data that lawyers care about is very, very unlikely, right? Because you get to that kind of like specialization at the, at the end of it. And so, you know, the, I look at it from, a, you know, if we think about websites, and this will kind of date me a little bit, but, you know, if everybody, you know, if you think about, like, does everybody remember what GeoCities was way back in the day, right? Very easy to build a we website. We already heard about Ask Jeeves earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. GeoCities, this so, is yeah, real so, cutting edge Yeah, so, you know, like, you know, it, I, you know, previous to that, to build a website was an expensive endeavor. Right? I needed to get a server. I needed to host a server. I needed to get a dedicated IP. I needed to like pay some ISP to give me a num uh, you know, thing and, and wire it directly. These are things that we've not talked about for 15 years. Uh, and it was very easy to go build out any kind of website. And I think we're seeing the same thing with AI, which is it's actually never been cheaper to build an AI powered piece of software. Uh, and, and that trend keeps on going down. And so then the question becomes like, like okay, where, where are the value pockets inside that stack? And obviously there's value pockets in the infrastructure and be, being the providers of that infrastructure. But there's also a ton of value in the data. And the reality here is if you go look at, so these large language models are mostly trained on uh, public data, um, all the public data that you can think of, but the private data available inside organizations is something like 40 or 50 X the size of all the public available data that exists in the world. And so we still have like very much pockets where the organizations that are approaching AI and talking to different companies and saying, Hey, we want to use this asset that we have, which is our data inside our company to provide an experience to whatever we do. That is probably going to be one of the strongholds, right? Where, um, all the big, folks in the, you know, kind of like all the big folks, they're going to be happy to provide the infrastructure and the abstraction layers and all the tooling so you can go build for that audience, but there's going to be a ton of value in that audience as well. And so I don't see it as a winner takes all uh, world, at least in this space. Charlotte, how do you think about that from the big company perspective? <laughs> um, it's kind of odd sitting up here being talked about in the third person and then having to <laughs> think about how I'm going to respond. Now, I, I, but I actually, in general, I agree. I, I too personally don't believe there's a winner take all. You, you can only 
rally behind that strategy if you agree you are going to be the steward for every part of the ecosystem, which rarely works, never works. And, and I think um, the first thing on behalf of all those big tech guys, we all need to recognize the importance of startups. They represent, the innovation of today represents the, the benchmark, the, the guiding path, the beachhead for tomorrow's workloads. And, and therefore, it's important for all of us to make sure it's a happy, healthy, and thriving ecosystem. And I think we're all committed to that um, on behalf of all of us big tech guys. I will, I will make that statement. Um, I do think that it, this is, again, another nuance. While it's never been cheaper to build an AI use case, that's with the statement of if you have free access to somebody else's LLM and you have free access to somebody else's data. You know, unlike the cloud, when it came out, we had this, this whole change in consumption where I didn't have to go physically get a server or get a staff to admin that server. I actually could buy something by the drip and I might pay a little bit more per unit, but I didn't need all the units if I had to buy the whole sandbox. You know, AI right now is expensive and it is very expensive. I think what you're gonna see is you're gonna see the economies actually start coming in, and we're already seeing it 10 months into it. The cost to compute goes down with every new rev and every new generation. It has to get to a more mainstream place for I think for it to be rapidly consumable by all. I think, um, but I do think it will, and I also think that the companies that leverage working with partners versus building their own, you know, open source is going to do a, a whole lot of goodness there to making sure that you have a lot of different components available to you to leverage to go build and innovate on. So I, I think on behalf of, of Microsoft, you know, we look at it as startups are very important to us. I mean, look at our partnership with OpenAI. I think that's a, a statement in and of itself. But we also have a responsibility to steward the ecosystem. We have a responsibility to seed it where the barriers to entry are high. And then, you know, we look to, to how we build partnerships as we go. And I think that's pretty consistent. So I, I don't believe um, this is a closed circuit for big tech only by any stretch moving forward. Yeah, there's also, a, I think, a commitment by the big companies to make sure it, it works and it's trustworthy. Correct. And I know that's a big thing for you. I, I know that you're, you're a horse rider, and I read an interview with you about the importance of riding a horse is having this trust bond with, with the animal so that you can successfully ride it. And it, it struck me that it's similar to using uh, AI tools. And I'm curious how you think about uh, trustworthiness in this, in this, in this, in this matter. Um, because a lot of people, I think, are losing trust in some of these tools and are fearful of it. Um, and so how do you think about that issue? Yeah, and I think Rav actually brought it up in, in his earlier comment. Look, at the technology is still young, and you've heard a lot of the very senior people in and around the industry you know, call for regulation, call for being able to have standards, um, and, and I actually think that needs to happen overall. You know, when we think about AI, again, leveraging AI for what you can use it for today, first start with what are the scenarios where you believe you can create that value? You know, for us, I have the responsibility of Microsoft. I, I'm not just um, looking at startups. I actually run a lot of workloads as to how we run our business. So I have large engineering teams that support different areas of our business. You know, we leverage AI today in ways that, how does it actually help us do our job better, quicker, faster, with more accuracy? But we do that within our shop so that we can also monitor and control and manage it. And Gaurav mentioned that. You know, one of the things that you have to do when you start thinking about leveraging whether it's using someone else's LLM or building your own, you're gonna have to be very responsible to make sure that it, it is built for purpose. And what I mean by that is not put it in a place or in a path where it can actually go off the reservation and create um, harm or, or damage to your users. We use it a lot internally for how do we do, you know, routing AI calls? How do we actually develop code quicker and faster, 
But in all of those scenarios, the humans are still involved. We're not outsourcing an entire process or an entire task to AI and, and leave and forget and move on. We're using it to help in areas and we're still managing it with eyes and people around that to make sure that it delivers on the promise that we want it to deliver. And I think that's where we are with the industry right now. It is, you know, as cheeky as it is, Satya said it well, it's, um, you know, co-pilot, the, the humans are still involved and we have that responsibility to remain involved no matter how we use the technology. It's not something that's going to, you can set out, you know, freely and, and hope it performs as expected. We're not there in the industry and we shouldn't assume we are, right? Diego or Gaurav, any thoughts? Yeah, well, I'm biased because I literally just co-founded a company called Guardrails AI uh, a couple months ago. So, uh, so I've been working in this space for quite a bit. Um, I, I think it's, you know, it's just what Charlotte says, like, you know, this is a, a, a technology that as soon as we can actually define its boundaries, that's a good thing because we can now plan and calculate risk with those boundaries and how to use it. We want to trust these workflows. We, we, if we go back to the first question of, you know, of the panel, which is like, how do you build a business? Well, you build some, a business around using a technology to achieve something that customers want. That involves trust, that involves being able to use it, that involves being able to understand um, you know, where it can go wrong and try to avoid that in, in a bunch of different places. And so there is ways, the good thing is that there's technology and there's ways to kind of create these boundaries, create these guardrails, create these situations where you can, um, you can make it work. This technology can work in a magical way, in my opinion, and, uh, and, and really be uh, uh, quite an advancement for us as, as humans. Um, I always had a, a little bit of a, a you know, problem with the word artificial intelligence because what we've really been working on is augmented intelligence for a really long time. And there's not a lot of artificial and it's kind of like a misnomer in my opinion. Um, but that's just kind of like, we, we see this like augmentation to these co-pilots and if we create the boundaries for it uh, and we enforce those boundaries, there's just really, really positive effects to building out these techs. We're going to open it up to audience questions. So if you have a question, just flag Maya, she'll come and find you. Um, I wanted to cite there was a recent KPMG survey of 400 US CEOs and it found that two thirds rank AI as a primary priority for their businesses. The weird thing about the survey was then it said 62% do not anticipate the investments paying off for three to five years. And so I'm curious how, as companies in Garb, maybe this is for you yeah. or Diego, like how are you investing in this area, especially as we've gone into tougher economic times with the realization that these payoffs might not come off for, for years? Um, I think the payoffs will be sooner than, than that. Um, we're already seeing real payoffs occur. Uh, GitHub Copilot, incredibly successful Gen AI product, is already showing real results for developers all over the world. Uh, but you know, I, I also empathize with these CEOs saying it'll take some time. If you're, I don't know, Walmart, then how you know moving your aircraft carrier of an organization to take advantage of these things will take longer. But if you look at pri previous disruptive technology. Um, these big companies can't sit back and ignore it. Like when the mobile phone came around, uh, or you know, I've been doing um, I've been doing startups and working in tech for long enough that I've sat in boardrooms when the question was, "What's your Web 2.0 strategy? Or what's your social strategy? Or what's your mobile strategy?" And now it's you know there was the crypto strategy, which was a hot flash flash in the pan, and now there's the you know what's your Gen AI strategy, which I think is 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 a, a much better one. But if you were um, you know a bank. You couldn't ignore, you could say, whatever, mobile, it's cool, like we'll add a, an, something eventually, but you'd miss out on your consumers being able to not go to the ATM machine to submit a check, uh, and your competitors would have that, and you'd start bleeding customers. Diego or Charlotte, I'm curious, if, if let's say you were giving advice to the CEO of Walmart, or Smuckers, or uh, Ford, or what have you, what, like, what would you tell them about what they should be thinking about or doing with AI. The first thing is identifying the use cases that are realistic and that there's proof points today in the market of those use cases being able to be solved with this technology. I think like that's like, I, there's the very clear ones. Like there's, there's no lack of use cases that have worked. And so just by defining that, um, the parallel I, I like to use here because this is what I worked on you know, almost 20 years ago, which is when BI, business intelligence, was first launched, right? Everybody was like, I want my business to be more intelligent. Like, can you help me make my business more intelligent? And like, 
that it's not a magic wand, right? It was like, oh, you need to get your data and you need to get your, your visualization. You need to understand your KPIs. You need to understand your metrics. So there's a process to getting ready to be able to adopt this technology. Same thing with like, uh, you know, with, with, with generative AI or any machine learning, right? Do you have the right data? Do you have the right teams to implement it? Have you identified the use cases? Do you understand what kind of ROI you're gonna get out of this or potential ROI? Have you measured like the effort and investment that you're gonna make in achieving this to the potential ROI? Like these are all kind of like, I realize very basic business questions that you were asked, but they apply to this technology more than, you know, just as much as any of them. And so I think like the, 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 the biggest problem, I think CEOs and CIOs in particular have gotten wiser over, you know, because they got bit by, you know, big data and BI and a bunch of that's not realizing the size of the investment that was necessary. I think now they're a lot smarter about those kind of things. So they do have those, their teams be a little bit more tough on kind of figuring out those use cases, but they exist. Yeah, I think, can oh, I go just ahead, add, yeah, I mean, sure. I, I want to really hit on what Diego said. I know we're short on time. I, I think the conversations you have with those CEOs are, how do I reduce my customer, you know, my call center support by 20%? How do I increase my developer productivity so I can launch you know, 10% more features? These are the kind of conversations that I think are the ones that are really actionable. Mm -hmm. and, and today they are finite in terms of the number, but I think we'll see that grow. Let's go right in the middle for the audience question there. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I guess this is best posed to Diego. Um, you're doing guardrail, and I wondered if you didn't think the disillusionment would come from the environmental impact that AI could have in that you've got uh, Redfin with their kind of generative AI play, and then you've got Gorov over here with his interpretive AI play. And what happens when you have AI on both the numerator and the denominator? So, I, 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 I go ahead. Right here. Maya. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I think like the, you know, I'm gonna try to break down the question here. There's kind of like multiple aspects to it, right? So, you know, the first of all is like, you know, the effect that it has, and I'm, I'm not, wasn't really sure if you were meant by the environment, like the actual computational effect, oh, or okay. like the, Got it, got it, yeah. So, um, got it, uh, I got the lucky question. Uh, the, uh, so, so, I, so I do think like, you know, the, the part that you have to like, we are going through a creative destruction to use the kind of economics like, 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 like episode, right, of humanity. Like, I think denying that is, uh, is, is, is in the worst case kind of ignorant right and uh you know in the best case is kind of like malicious right to a certain degree we are going through we are entering in uh uh a space where there is going to be creative destruction we had people doing jobs that are not necessary anymore and it is our job it is our hopefully role as a society to dedicate resources and people to retrain to uh, encompass it now with creative destruction, as has been proven in the past, like ultimately it's been better for humanity, right? Like we've gotten technology, we've gotten healthcare, we've gotten like, you know, like uh, uh, you know, top civilizations come out of it, but it's the reality is that this is, this is happening. And so as we now have a, the advantage of looking into the past and being studies of, you know, historians of our own humanity, understanding where the effects can be and kind of like dedicating time and resources to understand that I think, I think is important. One of the things that I think is slightly tangential to this, but like the access today to this technology is, you know, uh, pretty open, right? I'm not going to say it's ubiquitous because there's still people who don't have computers and like, you know, can't do it. So like that's unfair, but like it really has been democratized from an access perspective. And so um, if you haven't, and I have no, I am a stockholder in Microsoft, but I have no connection whatsoever to OpenAI. Um, you know, if you haven't, char you know, for your personal life, haven't tested ChatGPT, if you haven't actually used it, like, you should go home today and do it. Like, I, I, I can't, like, really kind of put together how important it is to understand the effects that this can have on your personal lifestyle. Like, I use it every day. I use it in every single one of my workflows. Like, it is amazing the penetration I have, and I think, the more we can get people to use this kind of technology to augment themselves personally outside of the companies that they're working for, it's gonna be better overall for us. And so that's how we're gonna kind of somewhat work through that creative destruction. But you know, to your point here, like we are going through that, that's gonna happen. 
Uh, it's about us to kind of like, how do I alleviate the worst effects of it? Yeah. One last question here. Um, thank you. This is a very interesting conversation. Uh, we have learned a lot from social media, good and bad both. Uh, AI is this next creative destruction, as you mentioned. I have this question for three of you. What are the three things that what we have learned from social media that we have to apply on the AI to at least address some fears that I, I get from my customers? I have healthcare customers. They don't want to use AI because they have fears. What are the top three things that I would love to see different answers from each one of you? Thank you. Great question. I don't know that I, I maybe, maybe I'll start and ask that the others. You know, I think the first thing is, one of the biggest challenges with social media has been the misinformation, right? And I, I do think the, the first conversation you have about AI, first conversation we usually have with AI about customers, they think the tech is great, but they immediately understand that it's only valuable when it's reasoned over their data, and their data is very special to them. Very private, very compliant in most cases, and therefore not something that they want you know, others having access to. So they would like to use AI, but within the confines of all their security, all of their compliance, all their regulatory environments. And I do think you know, that's where at least we've spent time evolving what, what Microsoft does. I think that's gonna be our responsibility in that because these are our core customers. And hence why you look at the differences between Azure OpenAI and OpenAI, for example. I do think in, in general, the one thing that we all have to do is when you come forward and say, hey, we've got technology available for you, we have to keep trust, compliance, security, kind of top of mind at all times. And I, I do actually think that's going to be very different than social media, which is the information out there was not just accessible by all, it was editable by all, with no checks and balances. And so at least what we're seeing with customers is they don't want their, their data out there accessible, much less editable by anyone else, right? They actually want their data to continue to remain secure, et cetera. That's on the, on the enterprise side. On the consumer side, you see a lot more um, inaccuracy that's happening, which is where I do actually think it's important that we have more standardization um, and more, quite frankly, regulation around that to ensure that that doesn't end up in the same place. I think that was a great explanation of like that kind of like tactical things. Like I have a more philosophical one. So like one of my favorite phrases is "timendi causa et necessary," which is ignorance is the cause of fear. Uh, and this is really about educating on like where we are with this technology, right? Like it is not like we are so far away from like autonomous, like you know, kind of like Terminator style, kind of like. Hopefully I'm like, you know, don't get called out on this later on. But like, you know, we're from a tech perspective and I, I stay pretty, like we're so far away from that. But people like need to understand. So to your point around like with social media, I think we now, and, 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 and I think as a technologist, we've done a fairly good job about explaining where the limits are of this technology, what it can be used, what it can. not And it's really up to everybody to kind of like go read up on it, understand where the uses are, understand where it can be, and to quash those fears, right? There is real fears to be had around kind of like, hey, where does these jobs, how do we retrain these people, what are we gonna do with this? But in terms of like fearing the technology itself, that's just usually associated with ignorance on the problem. Uh, and so, you know, it's our jobs to go, you know, reduce our own ignorance about anything, um, around to, qual to, you know, to quash that fear. Do you have any additional thoughts? I, Wrap I, us up here. I don't think anybody thought that Facebook could be used to steal an election or to you know, dramatically change opinions on major world issues with huge amounts of fake information that's coordinated that is highly specialized and targeted to people. Um, and uh, these large language models are very powerful at generating large volumes of highly personalized information. So that is one of the ways that this technology can be weaponized. So if there's some lesson to be learned, it, 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 it is that there are unforeseen consequences of this very powerful technology. We need to, I, I think the best defense against that is not technological. I don't think it's regulatory. Those things are patches, we'll do some of that. But I think it's education. It's, 
It's we all need to understand what's coming. We need to know. We need to question media when we look at it. We need to not just jump to a conclusion and have rage when we see an image or a video or, or hear a politician saying something. We need to pause and be like, I don't know, is this fake? Or is it real, but they're calling it fake? I, I don't know. So I think more, um, more education, more uh, pausing and thinking about what we're seeing, those are things we can learn from having gone through social media, realizing how dangerous and toxic it can be. Great. Gaurav, Diego? Charlotte, thank you for being here for, at the GeekWire Summit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.